Welcome to beautiful central New York. This is the view outside of my shop. I'm gonna take you inside. I'm gonna point out the major zones of my shop, the major machines, and then I'm gonna go into details about how each one of those is useful in the process of making fighting. So in my shop, I do CNC machining and other machining related stuff. And then I also am set up to do bicycle frame building. I'll cover everything. I'll focus more on frame building related stuff first. Here's the, the, the quick tour. I got a Bridgeport manual milling machine. I got my bench with a heavy vise, hand saw, ha uh, hack saws, hand files. My CNC milling machine from 1996. I got a manual lathe. I got a pedestal grinder. This is a DC TIG welder and my oxyacetylene torch rig. This is my shop made frame building fixture. This is my chop saw. I use this more for machining stuff than frame building right now. This is a one inch belt sander, really useful for tube prep. I love this guy. This is my Steel Age brand cabinet with drawers for tube storage. And then over here, this is one of the first pieces I got. This is a 32 by 36 inch steel table with a Blanchard ground top. You can use this for alignment and stuff. Uh, let me go over each, each little thing. This is my workbench. This is sort of where things began when I started to collect tools for my shop in about 2012. Uh, my dad and I made this bench. It took us a couple months of evenings and weekends just you know, laminating pieces together. And what I love about it is it's really heavy and, uh, and I made it with my dad. And it's rigid, you know, you can, you can push and pull on it. It doesn't perceptibly wiggle. I got a heavy vise here that's at elbow height. I got hacksaws and hand files and other hand tools within reach, and I use these on a regular basis. If I need a ruler, I've got it real quick. And I got a couple different rulers. Uh, you know, these, these pliers, I use these all the time, and I can put them away. I always know where they are. And, uh, you know, these scissors, use those all the time. Try Allen tool, all this stuff. You know, I try to think about what stuff am I using on a regular basis, keep that stuff really easy to access and like visible so that I can see across the shop. That's where it's at. It's really nice. You know, you can't put all your tools in this kind of storage, but it's really nice for the ones you use a lot. And so uh, when I was getting started, I used this bench for like so much stuff. I was mitering tubes to fit against each other in this vise. I was hacksawing tubing to length roughly in this vise. I was, uh, I would hold onto a, a piece in tubing blocks and then I would drill vent holes or water bottle holes. Just about everything that I did in the bike frame fabrication used to happen in this little zone. When I wired up the shop, there was no electricity in here. When I moved in, uh, I put you know four outlets right here, right by the bench vise. So if you need a, a Dremel tool or all sorts of stuff, you got outlets right there. This, I never even plumbed into air, but I specifically put it up there. I do have air in the shop. I should get that hooked up. That'd be a really useful spot. You know, you're doing a lot of work right here, a lot of general purpose work. And over the years, I've collected more machines and more specific fixtures and tools and stuff. And so that means that like when I go to do a particular frame building process or something, I usually have a better way to do it than like with hand tools. Uh, but still like as much of that as you have, you're always going to find opportunities where like it's just a little bit easier to do some weirdo thing by hand. In, and it's nice to have a nice way to hold it in a bench vise. And uh, you know, I have these wood tubing blocks that I can, I can hold on to tubing without crimping or crushing it. And so, you know, I do a lot of work right here. And now that I have this CNC milling machine, I'm doing all sorts of other stuff. But again, just, you know, I can quickly put something in here, tighten it down, whatever. Uh, this whole section has been essential to me. One of the first things that I got when I was building up my shop after that bench is this guy. This is a 850 pound steel table. The top is what, inch and a half thick, 32 by 36 inch area on the surface. It's Blanchard ground steel, so I know it's pretty dang flat. And I can use this as a reference surface to align my bike frames. I can also use it as sort of like a, a jig plate, you know, I can I can bolt some pieces onto it and I can hold the tubes for a bike frame on here. Uh, so I use this all the time for so much stuff when I was getting started building bike frames and it's still useful for a lot of things. And then like uh, two years ago, I, I made these drawers here and so I can put all sorts of stuff in here and then I can even pull the whole thing right out of here and carry it around the shop. And 
and they're shitty drawers. There's no slides or anything, but they work and it's really useful. It's a good length because you can fit full length bike frame tubing in there. This is the part of the shop where my TIG welder and my oxyacetylene torch rig live. And uh, this guy's on wheels so I can move it around the shop. The oxyacetylene torch is not. If I was building a lot of bike frames, I would probably want to have like a dedicated area where these stayed set up that was next to a proper welding bench with like a welding stand. And I just don't do a whole lot of frame building so I'm, I'm kind of tucking them away right now. I've done videos about both of these setups, multiple about the TIG welder and one about the oxyacetylene uh, rig. And, um, I like both of them and I think they're both pretty good setups and they, they do good for me. You know, you got to be able to glue the stuff together and that's, uh, this, is, this is what I use to do that. I'm getting ahead of myself here. I think probably the most important thing in my whole shop is this little cutie. Oh, Clem. Oh, she's snoozing. Yeah, she makes the whole shop run. She's a shop foreman. She's uh, she's kind of a, a cruel taskmaster. You know, she'll get on you about stuff, but uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. And you know, when you're thinking about uh, a shop foreman to hire, when you're ready for that, you just wanna, like the thing that's most important is this neck skin. You want a lot of neck scruff. Just, you know, that's what's gonna help you get work done. I picked this thing up kind of opportunistically. It just kind of came my way. I think I paid a hundred bucks for it. And it's this cabinet. Not only is it great for tube storage, cause most tubes are short enough to fit in here, but you can, remove the drawers and carry them around the shop. You can imagine if you were a, uh, if you were a professional bike frame builder and you're making you know, bikes all the time, you could put all the dropouts and brazons and tubes for each bike build into one of these drawers. And then on the day that you start that build, you carry it around the shop with you. Or the way that I do it is you know, main tubes, stays, all that stuff, and uh, it's pretty cool. In fact, this is what inspired these uh, these plywood, these crappy drawers that I made, and this thing was just, I wanted similar proportion drawers that I could put bike tubes or whatever into that I could also carry around, <laughs> carry around the shop. There's only barely enough room to get the drawers out here. It's kind of a pain in the ass, but I'm trying to maximize my floor space, you know? So. This bench I've covered in a video. I think this is a good way to make use of the shop space. I love this sander. I talked about this a long time ago in my chop saw video, but this guy really makes it easier to polish the ends of tubes, to get the mill scale off of stuff, to deburr things quickly. Really useful to have this guy in the shop. I waited until I got a good deal on this on Craigslist and uh, it was 50 bucks. Uh, it'd be worth paying more if you had to. These are totally awesome. This chop saw I use more for aluminum bar stock and steel and stainless and bronze and whatever stuff that I'm cutting that I machine on my milling machine uh, and not just bike tubing, although it kind of works for that. These chop saws have a carbide tip blade on them and so uh, you can cut aluminum and whatever. It's not a, an abrasive disc and then I bought this special base for it that al allows me to more easily make square cuts and stuff and in the coming uh, months here I'm going to be building a proper chop saw station for this with an infeed table with roller wheels so that I can more efficiently and effectively cut bar stock which is a little bit more machining oriented than it is bike frame related but I do have a different video where a couple months ago I had a different saw that lived here and that was really good for rough cutting steel bike tubing to length and so you should definitely check out that video if you haven't seen it. So this is my shop made frame building fixture and I've covered this in two other videos. This guy, you know, you load up all the different pieces of the frame, the dropouts and the tubes and all that shit and then you tack weld it together and I like to tack weld it in the fixture, take it out, I do an alignment check on my Blanchard ground table and then if it's looking good, I just weld it up and if it's out of, uh, if it's out of alignment, you can try to weld in a particular sequence where the heat pulls it into alignment again and that's a whole art and I'm not an expert with that but uh, Anyway, you know, this baby eats quite a bit of floor space and I'm not building bike frames every day. So sometimes I kind of wish that I didn't have it in here, but then when you do want to make a bike frame, uh, you know, it's, it's ready to go. And so this will stay here for quite a while, even though I mainly build tools at this point. Um, yeah, it really worked out pretty well for me. Check out my other videos if you're interested in this, cause I cover a lot of the details. So this is my manual engine lathe. I got this for a pretty good deal when I bought some of the other machines in this shop. And uh, this is the kind of thing where you could buy it 
for a reasonable price, 1500, 2000, 2500, something in there, get it moved into your shop. You could own a machine like this for like 50 years and sell it again for most of what you paid for it. I mean, who knows if we're headed toward apocalypse, right? But uh, these machines hold their value pretty well. They really don't cost that much money year after year to own. There's usually not that much maintenance involved. If you keep them oiled and you don't abuse them, they last forever. You can use them for all sorts of random shop projects. And then there's certain bike frame specific projects that they're really useful for. This one has variable speed. which is really cool. You can kind of hear that, uh, but it's just a, it's a Reeves drive with a belt and uh, really can be useful to have uh, variable speed on a machine like this. And um, yeah, just a lot of different stuff can be done on this. I'm gonna do a video where I cover this more in depth and how it's useful to frame building. Uh, but that's, uh, that's all I'll say right now. I made this, uh, this tool holder rack for all different cutting tools that get held on this tool post here. And so I can swap on this guy. And by putting it up here, they're always right at your fingertips and it keeps like, you know, the chips aren't gonna get uh, clogged up in there or collect in there particularly. I have collets and a collet closer. I'm missing one piece for that setup. I have a tailstock and you know, big chuck and a small chuck and all the stuff. You know, I try to keep it right here as much as possible. I had to make this goofy plywood chip pan for this thing because it didn't come with a chip pan and I got tired of all the chips collecting on the floor. So this way it's a little, little more orderly. Um, yeah, that's this machine. This is my three-phase pedestal grinder. This is made by Icy Wolf. Never heard of this company. Really, uh, it's a nice machine. I use this to grind the tungsten electrodes on my TIG welding, and I also use this to grind some tool bits on the lathe. If you have the old-school high-speed steel tool bits, you can grind whatever geometry you want onto them, which is really cool. It takes a little bit of practice to get familiar with it. You can sharpen drills and stuff. I don't think this is totally essential to building bike frames, uh, but it's really nice for a couple things. If you're just uh, trying to take the burr off of something or whatever, I kind of think the one inch belt sander generally does a little bit of a better job for a couple reasons, but uh, it's nice to have one of these and uh, yeah, it's what I use for tungsten. I need it for that. This is my 1967 Bridgeport J head step pulley, one horsepower, nine by 42 uh, Bridgeport milling machine. And so I have the six inch Kurt milling vise. It's a must have for a machine like this, I think. And uh, the Albrecht keyless chuck. I got my rack. You know, I did a video all about this machine, but basically, you know, this one machine allows you to do so many things in the shop. Uh, it speeds up a lot of processes and it makes it possible to do a lot of other stuff. And now I have a CNC version of this machine, right? And this thing here runs on computer programs. It's more rigid. It has more power. It's faster. It does so many other things. Uh, but this one is still preferable for certain operations. And when it comes to bike frame building, you really don't need a CNC mill. But this, I think, is like very important and very useful. And I got all these extra add-ons. I got the I got the power feed, and I got the the digital readout on the quill and on the X and Y axis. And um, it's totally awesome. Uh, you know, just really super super valuable machine that opens up. So many doors for little fixtures and stuff you can make and I wanted one of these for so long and the price seemed kind of high because I was really cheap and uh, I didn't have a space to put it and I didn't have a way to move it and it seemed like such a big to do to get one of these but uh, you know I studied up how to move these and I saved up a little bit of money and it was actually not that expensive or that difficult to get it set down and put to work and it just changes everything about what you can do in your shop. I can't recommend a machine like this enough to a small frame builder. If you got a little bit of space and if you can get together a little bit of money, really valuable investment. So this is my pallet jack. I bought this for $170 on Craigslist and uh, it works pretty good. I don't use it very often, but man, when I need it, it is really nice to have. That thing, I can scoot it underneath my milling machine. I can't so easily scoot it under my lathe, but uh, you can block that thing up and build a crate under it or a, a pallet under it. And then you can scoot that around. This will support 5,000 uh, pounds. That, that Blanchard ground steel table that I have weighs 850 pounds. That's really hard to move around, but I can get the pallet jack under and I can scoot it around. And uh, when I move this guy around, this is 6,500 pounds. Well, I have an axle that goes under the rear of it and I have this thing, uh, pallet jack goes under the front of it and that allows me to scoot this thing around the shop. And so when you start to have heavy stuff, if you don't like, let's say you rent a space and your landlord has a pallet jack you can use, 
that's awesome. If they don't, uh, this this little you know investment really makes it easier to live with these big heavy machines. So then you don't need to have a forklift. You don't need to like hire riggers to move stuff, and you can still scoot it around. Uh, pallet jack really valuable to have access to, whether you own it or not. So, you know, I can make bikes, I can make tools, I got CNC machines, but it doesn't mean anything if you can't get swole. And that's why I installed this pull-up bar. Oh! So this is my 1996 Bridgeport Torque Cut 22. It's this vertical CNC milling machine. It's made by the same company that makes the Bridgeport mill there, and it was made in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, right, Hartford? Anyway, uh, it was made in Connecticut, and so this machine is, is now, what I use this for is to make tools and stuff for my business, and this is the centerpiece of my shop because that's what I spend most of my time doing is making uh, tools and stuff. Uh, that I can sell to people and I'm not a professional frame builder and I don't make and sell bike frames for a living so a lot of the frame building stuff that I have in here is sort of from the time when I was pursuing frame building more earnestly and I also I want to keep that stuff around to the extent that I can because it allows me to continue to make this content for people to try and share some of the things that I picked up over the years and then also um, you know like if I'm making and selling these tools to people and at the same time that I'm making and selling tools to them, I'm not like some expert frame builder. Uh, you know, maybe I'm not going to be designing the best stuff. But if I can, um, if I can continue to try and develop my own skills and experiences with bike frame building, so that I can be better at it, then the design and the thoughtfulness that I put into the tools that I make and sell the frame builders will be better. And so I want to stay. I want to keep my hands in the process of frame building, and I want to keep my head in the game. You know, I want to learn about like uh, forward geometry mountain bikes with the mountain bike build. You know, that's a new thing. Like I want to be learning about that and testing that stuff. What's what's interesting with these machines is that the software has gotten more user friendly and more price accessible. Fusion 360, which is what I use, is basically free until you start to make a profit with your business, like over a hundred thousand dollars a year. And so. Um, uh, the software is more accessible. These machines, nowadays you can get a machine like this with an enclosure and a tool changer uh, and, and you know, what, th this maybe would have cost like $50,000 new or something in the 90s. Uh, nowadays you can buy something like this for under $10,000 in decent shape that runs and uh, you know, that's not out of reach for everybody. It's certainly a lot of money but it's not totally out of reach for people and so if you want to make your own dropouts or cable guides or if you want to make um, um, you know different components of the bike like stems or something there's a lot of stuff you can do with these machines now that was just kind of out of reach a couple years ago and it'll, see, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that I've seen uh, Pioneer Valley Frameworks has a small CNC mill uh, Drew from Engine Cycles got a CNC mill three or four years ago at least now uh, there's some other shops like I think maybe Moots or Comotion or something some of these larger scale American frame building shops have their own CNC mills and lathes maybe because they're they're actually producing enough volume volume of bikes that you know it makes more sense fiscally for them to produce some of their own stuff but it's also just really cool if you are building custom and you have a sense of uh you know, like, like th this derailleur hanger style or this brazon style or whatever, this thing, I, I have an idea for how I could make it work better for my application or for my customer. And so you want to make it in your own custom way. These machines are really good for that. And so um, it's, it's just kind of interesting what can be done with these. In the future, when I build bikes, I want to try and make my own dropouts and cable guides and stuff sort of for fun. And maybe those are products that I will release and sell at some point. I'm not sure yet. Right now I'm focused more on tools and stuff. But you know, so the shop is, is geared toward what I'm doing nowadays, making and selling tools, not so much around frame building anymore. I'm just trying to keep, keep this stuff here to the extent that I have space for it and I can hold on to it because I, you know, I wanna stay relevant with frame building. So my shop is a work in progress, and I think that's kind of true of everybody's shop uh, because, you know, what I'm trying to do here is changing over time. I would like to get a CNC lathe here at some point. I want to, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that I want to expand my capacity to do. I won't always have space for all these same things. Meanwhile, there's always organization projects that I can do to better use the space that I already have for the stuff that's already in here. And, uh, 
you know, it's, it's hard to do a shop tour video because it's never done and it's never as clean as you would like, but that's just kind of real life, right? Is that like, it's never in its optimal form because things are always gonna be changing and you never have enough money in the beginning to do everything exactly the way you want. So you're kind of, you know, you're kind of easing into it and you're, you're growing with your shop. And so this is where it's at right now. And I think it's presentable enough that I wanted to share it with you all. And that's why it took as long as it did for me to create this video. Um, yeah, so this is what it's like, and um, it, I'm sure it'll change over time. We'll probably do another tour video at a later date. Uh, you're gonna want to hit that subscribe button. A little bit of pedestal grinder in my room. Really got a lot of clutter here, right? This is the back corner of my shop, but this pedestal grinder 